I want us to be playing in Premier League stadiums. I want us to be filling Premier League stadiums. I want us to have games at Wembley. I want us to go to a World Cup and or a, or a major tournament. And I want us to tell the world that we want to win. Hey, hey, how are you? And welcome back to Outside the Box. Now, this is a brand new podcast all about women in sports. I'm Becky Ives, and here's the deal. For the next half an hour, 40 minutes or so, we're going to hang out with today's guest. We're going to share stories, offer help and advice to anyone thinking of wanting to get into working in sports. And well, here's a clue to today's guest. Get into coaching, perhaps. We're going to play a few games and just, yeah, have a bit of a laugh. Now, ultimately, this is all about getting more women working in sports. Now, cast your mind back to episode one. I did say that we'd be talking to mainly women, but not exclusively. And that's because today's guest is someone who, for me, when I think of women in sport and more specifically around football and the women's game, there is one name that has shone a massive light on it like really helped just raise the profile over the past few years so I thought it'd be awesome to hear his thoughts on women working in sports so by the powers that be that are zoom and Mm -hmm. the internet from a very safe social distance (laughs) Phil Neville has joined us yes afternoon how are we I'm good how are you more to the point unbelievable Uh, obviously just it's been a long three or four months worrying three or four months but we're just starting to see a little bit of normality and uh, and football's back and uh, and hopefully back soon on the pitch with the Lionesses Oh my God, it's it's been a long time coming as this, hasn't it? I don't think anyone can quite believe the situation that we are in right now. Um, mm. But yeah, look, I am so happy that you came on today. Thank you for taking the time. Um, I wanted to talk to you. I figured there was no one better to get an insight into working with women in sport than yourself, yeah. head coach of the England national team. I just want to take it back though um, to how this job came about for you. So if you cast yeah. your mind back to 2018, in actual fact, let's take it further back. You've just finished playing the game yourself. Yeah. Amazing career. 10 years at United, eight years at Everton. Um, at what point did you think, I want to go into management? Was it something you always wanted to do? Yeah. At the age of 24, I started to do my coaching badges. And the minute that I started to do the sessions that you had got to complete for your badges, I, I got the bug for it. I was obsessed with it. Uh, I enjoyed it. You know, some people do the coaching badges and just do it as a tick box just to get that license at the end of it. But I loved everything about it. You know, the detail, the the sessions and the planning, the preparing, the studying. Uh, and it really helped me in my career from the age of 24. So I, I became a student of the game, I, I started to ask a lot of questions of my coaches and my managers and the people in and around the club. And and almost maybe the last three or four years of my career when I was at Everton, it was a, it was almost like a, a transition from playing into to to coaching or managing. And uh, you know, I, I finished my career at the end of one season, and literally three or four days later, I was on a I was on a plane to uh, to to be with the under twenty ones in the in the European Championships as a coach with Stuart Pearce. And then I came back from there and I was literally uh, named first team coach at Manchester United with David Moyes. So people said I was inexperienced, but I actually felt that I prepared for that moment. And I think that is probably the biggest probably advice I would give to female um, and male coaches now is that the preparation to go into becoming a coach is the same preparation that you would do to study to be anything in life, a surgeon, a lawyer, or even to, you know, the work that you have to do to become a professional sportsman. It just doesn't happen overnight. You've got to put in years of work. And I felt as if I'd I'd put in a lot of work to get to that uh, moment where I got my first job. And that's the point, isn't it? A lot of people don't see that work that you actually almost probably then for the last three or four years of your career ran parallel careers because you obviously still were training full time, still having that schedule, but at the same Mm. time, then having to find time to do all the coaching stuff. Yeah, well, it was it was obviously my my career was my my priority, my career as a footballer and you can't can't deviate from that. The minute you take your eye off the ball, you you will get left behind by others that want to take your position. So, I think where what I did, I did little things like I I recorded every single session, I watched every single press conference that the top managers would do before and after games and in different situations. I would read I would read a lot of quotes and books and speak to a lot of people, coaches in and around football about their experiences. And, and I was just building almost an encyclopedia 
about how I wanted to work as a manager. And, and I think so, a coach said to me, uh, probably when I was about 32, what's your philosophy? If you went into a job now, what's your philosophy? And, and I felt as if at the time I thought, well, I know what my philosophy is, but I didn't actually write anything down in terms of a document. Uh, so I then went the next two or three years. It took me two or three years to formulate a document thought process to actually what I wanted my style to be. And there are, I think the, people say when you go on these courses, there are six different leadership styles that you that, that you can be. And, and, you know, I had to find my own uh, leadership style. And then I had to find a style of which I wanted my team to play, uh, my club to be like. And, and that took time to develop and put down into paper and into writing. And, and that was a really sort of like exciting thing where I spent a lot of time doing it. And still to this day, I'm changing and, and, and readjusting and, and it's a continual process all the time because trends continue to move forward and, and things come in and out of fashion. Well, you played under two of like, well, Sir Alex Ferguson, mm. greatest manager in Premier League history, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and David Moyes as well. Incredible uh, career he has as a manager. How much did they influence your style? Because you said about finding your style, writing mm. your philosophy, know what it was. But what type of manager are you? Well. You think about Ferguson and Moy, you think about the top five Premier League managers. Uh, I think maybe you've got Ferguson, you've got Wenger, then you've got Moyes, Redknapp. You, you, you've, you've, I've played for two of the top three or four in, in, in the Premier League history. So I think they had a massive influence on my style. And Sir Alex, Sir Alex obviously had a massive influence from the age of 10 to the age of 28. He was my father figure. He was the first point of, of contact and he had the biggest influence. But then I think I think what was good for me in my career, I then went to Everton and learnt over a I learned with a different manager who was slightly different in the way that he worked, in the way that he coached, the way that he managed. And I think that helped shape my thinking that probably not all one way is, is the best and you've got to sort of like find your own niche. And I think I think in terms of style, uh, or in terms of what type of manager I am, I think I think I've took the best bits from all the manager uh, managers I've I've played for, and sometimes you learn from the managers that didn't really impress you, or they didn't really sort of like inspire you to actually how you want to be. So uh, I would say I'm hopefully a cross of uh, you know a, a little bit of a a mixture of everyone plus the play plus the people that I've studied, you know, Bielsa mm. and Pochettino, are, are people that you know I've loved I've loved watching develop. I, I remember hearing about Pochettino when he was at Espanyol and Bielsa when he was the Chile manager. I remember watching them play thinking, wow, how intense. And then I followed followed him then when he went to Bilbao and looking at the way that he trained his players and the intensity of his work and the detail in which he went into. So, so I just formulated my own. So I could actually, when I wrote my philosophy and people see me, they see it as mine and not just always oh, copying Sir Alex, he's copying David Moyes or whatever. I wanted to be authentic and I think I think in my first management job now, the one thing I would say is that I, I want to be Philip Neville. I want to be authentic, and I want to live and die by my rules and my philosophy, rather than people thinking he's a mini me of someone else. You know? Yeah, no, individuality is so important. Yeah. So, as you said, you went back then to Manchester United, first mm. team coach under David Moyes. Um, sort of within the period of the next three or four years, you then also went out to Spain. Yeah, uh, worked out there. <laughs> Smile on your face there with your brother yeah. Gary. At this point, when you were doing this, how aware were you of the women's game? When I was at Manchester United, my son was at Manchester City as in the academy. He was eleven years of age, and I used to go down and watch him train. And obviously, the the girls, Man City, has probably one of the uh, best, you know, female setups there. And and I used yeah. to see them. I used to see them in and around. Used to see them on the next training pitch. Uh, but ultimately, my focus was on being the first team coach at Manchester United. And, and obviously, I watched the 2015 World Cup. I watched the 2017 Euros. But ultimately, I think in our walk of life, you focus on the job that you've got. right, And then everything else is a blur, blur at the side of it. And I've got to say, I mean, at the same time, my sister was playing netball for England. And, I, and if you ask me, you know, what was she doing at that time? I would say, well, she was playing netball for England. But I really couldn't tell you what what tours she was going on, what the results were, because I was so tunnel visioned. Uh, and I suppose it wasn't until the 2015 World Cup probably had an effect on me because that was the first time probably that in my own head, 
women's football became sort of like apparent and visibility in, in, mm. in, on the televisions. Obviously, the, uh, Mark Sampson was a fantastic manager for the team and what they did in Canada put the team on the map really in terms of sort of like the expectation level. And then 2017, I was in Valencia and the the girls trained at the Valencia training ground. So I went I went I went round and watched them train. So I, I then started to probably take interest in them in terms of the big games, the big tournaments. But other than that, the focus was on my own job really, and uh, that's the way it is at elite sport. Yeah, but then the call came. Yeah, to take over the job. Do you remember? that call coming was it a conversation was it a phone call were you asked like well I, ob- I obviously knew that Matt Sampson had left I knew that Mo Marley was in interim and I knew that there was a job there and and I've got to say people say that I was she warned into the job but it, it, it was it was over a three to six month period where I, I had a really good relationship with Dan Ashworth the technical director who's now at Brighton and we'd been speaking about because at the time I was out of uh, work in terms of football I was working in television and he was really sort of like uh, uh, encouraging. I said, "Look, we need you back in football. We want all our best. Uh, we're not. We want all our best coaches working, young coaches working, and getting jobs. And 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 we worked closely together for probably three to six months. And that I say worked closely together. We we swapped ideas. We we, we chatted about opportunities. And then obviously he, he rung me. I never forget the day. It was fifteenth of December, and I'd I'd flown home from Valencia because I was living in Spain at the time to do a TV program and I was staying at my mum's because when I used to come back I stayed at my mum's and he called me I was in I was in my old bedroom and he said look uh, would you be interested uh, in in applying for the job as the England women's national coach and uh, my initial reaction was it's not something I'd thought about uh, mm-hmm. and I said look c- can I think about it he obviously he went into the detail about what what was ahead etc I came off the phone and the minute I put the phone down, I thought this, this, this is an unbelievable opportunity. Uh, and and that night, I went out on a Christmas party with my mum and my sister, and we were talking round. And and for the whole night, all we kept talking about was this opportunity. And 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 Tracy was probably the one that really hit it home to me in terms of she said, "Look, it's it's been a real hard slog." women's sport in general she said but you know what the last 12 months I think we're beginning to see a little bit of light there's a little bit of uh encouragement there's a little there's more opportunities we're getting a little bit more visibility I think if you came in now I think you'd be coming in at the time just before sort of like the boom I think you would be sort of like coming in at a time where actually people are more open to uh females being on television females being in boardrooms females getting opportunities on tv and she said i think it'd be a great opportunity for you my brother said the same my wife said the same and uh i phoned dan back and said i'm really interested and then i i, I had to speak to sue campbell uh, just mm-hmm. to gauge interest and, and from that moment onwards me and sue became became sort of like inseparable we had the same aims we had the same vision and i think because she because she had this vision of where to take the the senior women's team because she asked me, she said, look, what's your vision? And I said, well, I want to take this women's team to a place where they've never been. And she went, well, well where's that? Well, I went, well, I want, I want us to be playing in Premier League stadiums. I want us to be filling Premier League stadiums. I want us to have games at Wembley. I want us to go to a World Cup and, or, a, or a major tournament. And I want us to tell the world that we want to win not just go and compete, not just go. And I said, I want us to push down boundaries and make opportunities for women's footballers. And she said, well, well how are you going to do that? I said, well, it, it, it's going to be, it's going to have to take risks. And the minute that I started to talk about taking risks and, and pushing people out of the comfort zone, it, that's what she, that's what she wanted. That's what she loved. And we spoke about it, about climbing Everest, et cetera. And, uh, and she's, she backed me, you know, from, from the period from getting the job to the world cup, we, we took unbelievable risks about getting mm-hmm. our girls out there in the open, about having TV cameras following us, about going to, we, we, at my first game in England was at Southampton and, there was trepidation about, oh, can we fill this stadium? Can we sell the tickets? Will it be empty stadium? And there was 30,000 people there. And, and from that moment onwards, I just felt we were on this this crisp of a wave of actual momentum. And, and the girls, I've got to say, the players, they the minute that I walked in and started to tell them where we were going, 
they jumped on board and they they drove the bus. They drove the bus. Well, it's probably because they've, they've known what's within themselves for years, but they've never had the platform to show it. And then someone like you walking in there saying, this is what I want to do. It's almost like they've gone, thank you. We are so on board with this. Yeah, well, we'll show you what we can do. I think, Becky, I think, I think the, like people, I, I got, I got real criticism for taking the job. 